I think one of the most important things a human being can do is press the pause button each morning while the rest of the world is asleep and ask yourself, how can I fortify my mindset? We stumble before we walk and then on shaky legs, we embrace the new habit. And that's the very nature of personal transformation. I mean, every master was once a beginner, every professional was once an amateur. First, I want to ask if you can talk a little bit about what that plan is, why it's more powerful than other morning routines that people might talk about. And then I want to ask you a follow-up question on it after that. You know, Lewis, I've been teaching morning routine uh, for 24 years. I wrote a book years ago called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Uh, where I talked about the ritual of early awakening, and I talked about the 5 a.m. club. You know, the Spartan warriors, I learned a lot from them. These are human beings that were fierce in the resolve to do amazing things. The Spartan warriors had nobility and honor. Uh, look at the world we're in right now. We need to do what it takes to become stronger as well as more compassionate. The Spartan warriors' mothers used to actually say to them, come back on your shield, come back victorious, or don't come back at all. Wow. And the Spartan warriors also used to say, sweat more in training and you'll bleed less in war. And so we live in a world, obviously there's COVID, but I think this is a time of incredible unrest. We've got social unrest for all of the unjust injustice that is, has been out there for so many years. We've also got a financial crisis, which I believe is going to get much worse. Really? And uh, we've got, we, for, for sure, I'm, I'm no uh, financial expert or an economist, but I mean, if you look, at, you look at all the quantitative easing happening right now, and if you look at the low interest rates and all the encouragement that we buy more and spend more right now to pump and jumpstart the economy, we're just pushing... Uh, and the inevitable collapse further mm. down the road, I believe. Mm. So I think we have, you know, we have the coronavirus and we have, have some early optimistic trials on the vaccine, which I'm very encouraged about. And then we've got all these other things, including an environmental uh, catastrophe in the making. So with that context, uh, I think one of the most important things a human being can do is press the pause button each morning while the rest of the world is asleep and ask yourself, how can I fortify my mindset? How can I insulate my heart set? How can I optimize my health set? How can I escalate my soul set, the four interior empires that I've introduced in the 5 a.m. club, so that when I walk out in the world, I'm creative, I'm productive, I'm compassionate, I radiate positivity, and I have resilience in case I get knocked down. And so I think one of the best ways you can do that is this 2020 formula that I've been teaching to the billionaires, the NBA stars, the film icons, and many of the most successful people on the planet for, uh, as I say, 20, uh, 24 years. And uh, very high level, Lewis, the 2020 formula is simply this. You get up at 5 a.m., and anyone can get up at 5 a.m. One of the gifts of a human being is neuroplasticity. We are built to change. So please, I would encourage, you know, if we recite our excuses long enough, we actually believe they're true. We are built to change. We are built to grow. We are built to own our heroic nature. And so according to University College London, if we do any practice or habit for 66 days, we reach a point of automaticity where it becomes easier to do that new habit than not do the new habit. Once you wire in the new habit, for the first 20 minutes, five to 5.20, you move. Because you can release BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which promotes neurogenesis. It optimizes your brain. Uh, if you move first thing in the morning, you release serotonin, which makes you feel good. You release dopamine, which you know, sets you up for inspiration. Second, we can get into it more deeply, but second pocket from 5.20 to 5.40 is reflect. You know, While the rest of the world is asleep, there's such quietude in the air. This is where you can pray, you can meditate, write in a journal, sit in quietude, so that you're focused and living your life and your priorities through the day. And then the final pocket of the 20, 20, 20 
formula that I talk about in the 5M Club is grow. You'll never get old if you grow. You'll never become obsolete in your business, even in a time of great volatility, if you're growing. You'll always stay happy if you grow. So 20 minutes at the end of this victory hour, that's what I, what I call it, uh, you spend some time listening to a podcast like Lewis Howes on the School of Greatness, a man adored by the majority of humanity. Um, <laughs> you listen to a, an audio book, you read a book, you study your battle charts. And anyway, that's a, a really rough general way to explain the 2020 formula that is currently helping millions of people navigate this hard time. Does it matter the sequencing of 2020? Do you need to move first? Can you meditate first? Do you grow a lot, you know, or is that a, a process that is proven scientifically? The process has been proven in the trenches of elite performance for a long time with my clients. Yeah. And having said that, you know, I would say the 2020 formula is minimum viable morning routine. Mm -hmm. And you're a biohacker. I'm a biohacker. I'm a productivity hacker. I'm a life hacker. And so I would say, do what's right for you. You know, it's mm -hmm. like this whole field of personal mastery and leadership that we inhabit. I, I'm, I'm not one to say you must do this because we all have different learning types. We're all on different journeys. Mm -hmm. Someone is, might be right now upgrading their spirituality so they connect with their crusade and their higher power in this time of house arrest. Mm -hmm. Other do people are creating their masterwork right now. So I think right. we have to find the routine, that, the morning routine that works best for us. What about people that say, you know what, I'm just a night person. You know, I like, I think at night, I work out at night. That's when I meditate, uh, you know, I strategize the next day at night. And I just, I've tried the morning. It just doesn't work for me. What would you say to that? I've case? had a lot of night owls. Who have, <laughs> That's a great excuse, isn't it? To be a night owl. <laughs> I've had a lot of great, a lot of night owls who have said, you know, I could never be a morning person. I've had a lot of people who've said, you know, grandma couldn't get up early, grandpa couldn't get up early, my parents couldn't get up early, I don't have early rising genes, you know. And what I would say is, if you don't read that book you've been resisting because you don't think it's for you, you might just miss your new favorite book. Mm. If you fall in love with your most closely cherished beliefs and you're not open to trying new things, you might miss your new fa trying your new favorite food. If you say, well, here's the kind of friends that I hang out with and I'm not open to anyone else, you might miss that new friend or that new mentor who will transform the way you run your craft and live your life. And it's the same for the morning routine, the 5 a.m. club. I mean, it's just, I, I've had so many people read the book, run the models in the book, live the message, and achieve what they never thought they'd achieve. Yeah. And so what I would say to a night owl, or a lot of people say shift workers or whatever, I would say give it a try. And don't just give it a try for, for a week, you know. Give it a try for three weeks, four weeks, the 66-day minimum. Mm. And then judge, by, then judge by your results. Hey, it's Lewis here, and I would love to connect directly with you. Text me the word YouTube to my number 614-350-3960 to receive weekly inspirational messages from me. I did this for, I was getting up at, uh, not, not that I was in competition, but I was getting up at 4.50 a.m., Robin, mm -hmm. for a few months, a couple years ago, and I was doing a 5 a.m. workout, and that's how I do it. So I was spending an hour in the morning working out at 5 a.m., then I was coming back and meditating and strategizing for the day. And it was extremely challenging for me for the first month. Um, but then it got better and better. And I started to make it a, a you know, something that I was proud of, you know, or I would call it beating the sun. I was like, I'm going to beat the sun tomorrow and I'm going to wake up. And the first 20 minutes are not fun for at least a month. And Maybe it's never fun in the first few minutes because you could, it always feels more comfortable to sleep until your body really starts to find a routine and a rhythm that, okay, you're just going to bed by eight or nine and you start to appreciate that process in a different way. You might have loved being up late before 
in its own way, but this is a new way to find appreciation. So uh, I'm not in that space right now. My, you know, my girlfriend moved in and I said, you know what, I'm going to allow myself to sleep in a little bit with her and experience something different. But I tell you what, I always feel more productive when I'm consistently waking up earlier, um, even if it's uncomfortable. Well, th there's a line in the 5M club, which is all change is hard at first, messy in the middle and gorgeous at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so you were telling me, I, I don't think you'd mind, but before we Go ahead. started recording, you, you were sharing how you're running more. And it's, it's like the first time you run. It's like the first time you ski. It's like the first time you fall in love. It's like the first time you play chess. I mean, we, 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 we stumble before we walk. And then on shaky legs, we embrace the new habit. And that's the very nature of, personal transformation. I mean, every master was once a beginner, every professional was once an amateur. And so this, this, this idea that we need to be masters right out of the gate, that we need to, you know, get up at 5am and instantly it should be easy. Well, falling like a great relationship isn't easy. Building a world-class business that stands the test of time isn't easy. Uh, becoming a, a maestro or any kind of a virtuoso, it's, there, it's always a process. I mean, I know you, you interviewed Kobe. Well, I think what made Kobe Kobe was his intense, rigorous practice over many, many years. Yeah. You know, he just out practiced out everyone around him. And I think, you know, we live in a world of easy. We want the easy morning routine versus the morning routine that'll give us the greatest payoff. And I just, there's a reason, Lewis, that a lot of the great saints, sages, poets, military leaders, world changers got up at 5 a.m. and before the sun. I think it's the quietest time of the day. You, if you look at willpower researchers, we wake up with the most willpower when we first wake up. You have the most mental focus before mm -hmm. the phenomena of attention residue takes over and cognitive bandwidth is high. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been profound for me. How does someone be consistent in their discipline? You know, when most people will say, I'm going to do this for three months or six months, but then, ah, uh, interruption, COVID, ah, uh, uh, I got sick, ah, uh, something, someone in the family needs, needs me and I'm up all night. And what's the difference between what Kobe did for two decades in the NBA where he was disciplined how is he able to stay motivated and how are the greatest able to stay motivated where others seem to lack the motivation and discipline to be consistent because anyone can do it for a few weeks, but how do you do it for years and decades? What's the difference between that? It's, it's an excellent question. And I, and I would say, first of all, in COVID right now, may we give ourselves permission to be gentle with ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even this whole idea that we must be machines in terms of our morning routine or even our pre-sleep rituals. This, these messages that are out there that we must be monomaniacally consistent and flawless human beings for us to wear our badges of honor in society as leading members of the cult of productivity. You know, I, I'll just, <laughs> I'll confess right here to you right now. I, sh I sure am no guru and I slip. I slip, you know, I, I slip on the 5 a.m. club I have had uh, those, those evenings where I feel like a few extra chocolate croissants. And I, I just think we must give ourselves permission to be humans. I think, you know, I was flying uh, on a little plane um, from White River, South Africa to this game reserve. And the pilot let me fly the plane for a little while. And he kept on saying, you know, the winds are going to push you off course and just, you know, keep, keep that. I think it was the altimeter or whatever, but just keep it in the center. And so the, the currents, Lewis would pull me off course. And then I just, you know, look at the dial and I'd come back. And I really believe, you know, that's, that's, that's how we live our days mm -hmm. as human beings. I mean, I'll get up and sometimes there's a current, like you said, you know, a child who kept you up at night or it's in the pandemic. So maybe you're worried or maybe you've lost a job. And so those currents will take us off course. And so our job is just to steer back on course each mm. day. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're not perfect human beings. Yeah. So it's okay to 
to sleep in once a week or to miss miss the routine once in a while, it's not going to affect your overall, you know, results or process. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think, you know, if you want to commit to the 5 a.m. club, you want to commit to a world class morning routine because the way you begin the day profoundly sets up the way your day unfolds. Mm. And this, again, this is not an anecdotal. You get up in the morning and you run the 20-20-20 formula that I explain in the book, you will create the flow state. You will release serotonin. You will release dopamine. You will release BDNF. You will increase your metabolic rate. You will boost creativity. You will uh, increase your willpower. You, you know, all those things. I mean, we, we want, we all have the ability as human beings to ar arrive at our own original form of greatness. Mm -hmm. We have not been schooled. We have not been taught. A lot of us have not been mentored on the mindsets, heart sets, routines, rituals that will create and allow us to live our personal genius. But, you know, if you look at the greatest women and men who have ever graced the planet, these were so-called ordinary people who just set up their lives in such mm -hmm. a way that their native gifts saw the light of day. It's funny how no one ever teaches this stuff unless you had a parent or an older sibling that's, that you were able to model and mimic. Like, oh, my, my dad gets up very early or my brother gets up and does his violin or practices a sport, or whatever it may be. And I want to be like that. And I want to try that. It's, you know, we're not taught this in school. You know, Lewis, I, um, when I was a kid, I wasn't believed in by a lot of people. I marched to my own drumbeat. I had a different way of seeing the world. I was very sensitive. I was very creative, very much a, a dreamer in many ways. And uh, I didn't fit in with the cool crowd. And in grade five, I had a history teacher, and her name was Cora Greenaway. And she was one of the first people in my life who believed in me. And we all meet a Cora Greenaway. And may you and I and everyone listening from around the world or watching from around the world, may we be a Cora Greenaway to someone else. And what I'm suggesting is all it takes is that one person who coincidentally shows up in our life and maybe it's a book maybe it's a podcast episode to introduce us to a new frame of reference and a new way of living it might even be that's why i love reading so much you know it's it could be one idea in a 300 page book and that idea opens you up to a new galaxy of possibility and the hand that puts down the book is a fundamentally different hand i mean all it takes is one new insight to change the way you see the world that's very true and so yeah, and that's why I'm such, on such a mission, and I've been on such a mission for 24 years to remind people of who they're meant to be. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you have not discovered something you're willing to die for, you're not fit to live. And I, I believe we all need to find our mighty mission and our crusade. Mm. It doesn't have to be lofty. It could be delivering pizza by Uber Eats. It could be a, you know, a teacher. It could be a lawnmower. It could be a, a coder. It could be a grave digger or a street sweeper. All, all labor has dignity but you know th there are no extra people on the planet and i think you know that's why i appreciate the work you do so much i mean we do have greatness within us and society has brainwashed us and heart washed us into thinking that the great ones are cut from a different cloth and it's not it's not true as, as a matter of fact in the 5m club i say you know Genius is less about genetics and, and much more about your daily habits. Wow, that's true. That's, I mean, I, that's, that resonates with me because gr growing up a kid that was, you know, dyslexic and still struggles with reading and writing today and was in the special needs classes, I never thought I was going to amount to much. And I didn't have belief in myself until I found a spark and belief in myself. And then I started mm -hmm. leaning into that gift, which was sports and started to realize, oh, I have some vision and I have some coordination and I have some speed. Even though I was never the fastest or strongest, I had some height. And so let me lean into this gift that was here and see if I enjoy this gift and see if I like this gift and see if this brings me joy. And it did and I continued. 
And uh, then I built routines and habits around that gift and kept pursuing it until, as far as I could pursue it until it was no longer a dream or until the, the gift was no longer there, until I wanted to pursue other things. And I think, um, you know, even if whoever's listening or watching, even if you didn't think you were talented or smart enough at some point, there's something inside of you that is talent. You've just got to keep trying things and see what brings you that joy and that uniqueness. At least that's what I would say. Well, you know, j just to just a hitchhike off of that, Lewis, I think no one will believe in, in you until you believe in you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I'm writing this new book I'm writing, you know, I've been I've been looking at people like J.K. Rowling, for example. I mean, everyone laughed at Harry Potter, you know, oh, no one will ever re read this. Mm. And she believed in this character about a child wizard who who had all of these adventures and she was a single mother and she was suffering and she had no money. And she wrote the whole idea for the Harry Potter concept came to her on a, on a delayed train ride. And then I believe in Edinburgh, she wrote the first Harry Potter and it was rejected. And we all know this, but it, like, you know, just a gentle, respectful, loving reminder for everyone who's, who's tuning in here, which is every visionary is initially ridiculed before they're revered. And look at Jonas Salk. Look at Elon Musk right now. I mm -hmm. mean, look at Shakespeare. Look at Oprah. Look at Martin Luther King Jr. Look at Nelson Mandela. Look at Mary Curie. Look at... Edison and Einstein, look at Galileo. These were all ordinary people who followed their joy, who, who came up with a vision. And the very nature of a great vision means you're going to disrupt the status quo. Mm. So you're going to scare people. I mean, if your idea is really good for that new business or that new relationship or that new fitness routine or morning routine, it, it's, it's going to scare people who are card-carrying members of the status quo. Mm. And so it's much easier to shoot the messenger than to embrace the message. And so it's much easier. It's much easier. I mean, I'll tell you completely candidly, I spent four years writing the 5 a.m. club. I put my heart and my soul in, in the book, the models and the art that was done by this uh, amazing artist and every line I wanted calibrated. And, you know, people didn't understand what I was trying to do. And when the book first came out, I looked at the Amazon reviews and they were terrible. Really? Why? Now, well, and, and I just want to say now it's one of the best selling books in the world. And mm. it's almost as if the tide shifted once enough people read it. And the narrative changed. It was the most interesting thing. But I, I, I've actually... That, that really hurt when the book came out. It's like holding your baby out into the world and, you know, everyone's looking at it going, you know, just want to tell you, your baby is really ugly. <laughs> not, so ple <laughs> not so pleasant to look at. Yeah. And, you know, what I would say is J.K. Rowling, again, she said, for some to love you, some must loathe you. Ooh. I would say also, Bob Dylan, don't criticize what you don't understand. And so if you do anything that's mm. disruptive, and also if you, put, if you put out work that challenges people to leave their comfort zone, to wake up to their genius, if you, if you challenge people to be more loving, to stand for love on a planet that has too much hate, if you challenge people to get up at 5 a.m. to spend one hour working on your mentality, purifying any toxicity within your heart set, Upgrading your health and longevity, mining your spirituality in a world of selfies and dancing cat videos and a lot of superficiality and a culture of comparison. You're going to, you know, I mean, it's easier for people to shoot you down versus to embrace the message. Mm-hmm. Does, when we're on unusual times right now, does the 5 a.m. routine 
uh, in the 2020 shift. If things are, there's an excuse, oh, I'm tired, and then there's a shift in the world. Does the 5 a.m. club shift at this time? Do people say, you know what, let me really take it easy for a few months, or is that an excuse for too long to get back into your vision? I think that's a profound question, and I would say trust your instinct. There are times, for example, as an artist, when I'm writing and it's flowing, and I just know this, trust your natural cycles because your higher power, call it your instinct, call it your intuition, call it your artistry, knows what it's doing. So there are times to be productive and there are times to rest. Now, I, I very much believe in the 5 a.m. club and the 2020-20 formula. I very much believe that it will create a pharmacy of mastery within your brain. It's been proven by science. You know, even just the, the, the simple idea of starting your day with some sweaty exercise. Why sweaty exercise? Is because sweat reduce, when you sweat, it'll re release the BDNF, which John Rady at Harvard calls miracle growth for the brain. But just that idea of exercising first thing in the morning will, will help you become more resilient, peaceful, mm -hmm. strong during the day. So yes, do your morning routine. Yes, run the 20-20-20 formula. And then judge by results. Having said that, if you've been up at three in the morning because you've lost your job, mm. because you're just picking up on the energy of the world right now where there's so much fear, uh, you're dealing with COVID, or you have a family member you've lost as a result of the pandemic, self-love, personal care requires that you rest, recover, and do what you need to do. And I think, you know, that's one of the things, I say this with great respect, but when I read the books or see people saying, you must be like a robot and follow a morning routine or a nightly ritual or whatever your, your, your best habits are, I believe there must be room for the hard seasons of life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when my heart has been broken, when I've gone through my periods of suffering, I haven't been as disciplined. I haven't been as rigorous. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've had the inopportune pizza night, <laughs> you know. And, and here's what, what I would always also say is my ego, because a bad day for the ego is a great day for the soul. My <laughs> ego says, Robin... You're not being productive. You're not on your A game. You're not a warrior. But you know what I've realized? I might not be creatively productive according to the definition of society during those cycles or seasons of suffering. But am I not spiritually productive? Am I not emotionally productive? Mm. I mean, when does a human being crack the shell of the ego that covers their hearts and learns the, the human virtues. I mean, w w Nelson Mandela learned how to be Nelson Mandela in his Robin Island season. Yeah. And so I think we learn honesty mm. and compassion and vulnerability and creativity when things are falling apart, not when they're in the, not in the seasons of sunshine. Yeah. And I, I look at uh, life in terms of sports analogies. And so for me, there's four seasons in, uh, you know, I guess the seasons of the year, but then also in sports, there's, there's really kind of four seasons as well. There's the, the preseason to prepare you for the mm -hmm. season. And then there's the, the playoff season, which is where you're, you're hustling, you're all in, you're, you're, you're only thinking about one thing and you're focused on that energy and you're, you're not burning the candle on both ends, but you're, you're all in on that thing and less on everything else. And then there's the postseason, where, okay, the championship is done or that season is done. And now we have the postseason, the time to reflect, the time to reevaluate our goals, our life, what worked this last season, what didn't work. Do I need to tweak my routine? Do I need to, you know, be in different relationships? Who do I need to bring into my circle? What do I need to eliminate in my circle? So I look at 
life in terms of, you know, sports seasons, um, just because that's how I've lived my life. But I think if, and if we can, do, we can do that, then you're going to have time to rest and reflect. And you're going to have a balance in that kind of seasonal progression of life where it doesn't have to be robotic every single day, you know, for 20 years or the rest of your life. So at least that's the way I look at it. You know, I think, I think rest is a secret weapon. There, there's a line in the 5M Club, which is rest is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite authors is Haruki Murakami, the great Japanese novelist. And he said, when I'm not writing the book, I'm writing the book. I mean, you're an author, Mm -hmm. but it's not any creative, any productive. We we beat ourselves up, or maybe it's just me, but we beat ourselves up if we're not doing. But how Mm -hmm. can you calibrate world-class doing if you don't make the time for being? And so... And so those times where, you know, nature or our instinct or our inner artist says, these are times to pull back from the world and sunbathe and read the classics and write in a journal and have four hour meals with the people we love and travel when it used to be safe to travel. Those are not times to feel guilty. John Lennon said, time you enjoy wasting is not wasted time. And so what I've realized is the greatest productives, the greatest artists, the greatest thinkers, the greatest heroes, they were cool with rest and recovery. Mm -hmm. They understood that elite performance is not like a marathon. It's more like a sprint and the energy project to give credit where it's due. That's they've evangelized this, you know, when they talk about energy. It's, you know, the greatest productives work in sprints versus marathons. And so all I'm saying is, you know, you're right. Like life is a series of seasons and enjoy the seasons. And that's what's going to actually allow you to play the game for a long time, but also do your greatest work. I mean, my instinct now is I'm about three weeks away from submitting this manuscript on the new book. And my instinct is get into another book. And this morning I realized. (laughs) I'm going to take take next year. I'm going to have great conversation. Mm. I'm going to travel. Hopefully it'll be safe to travel. I'm going to enjoy the fruits of my labor and enjoy life. And that's going to be incubation for the next book. after. Yeah. I think that's key because, you know, I started about a year, year and a half ago, I started saying, okay, I'm going to write my, I'm going to start working on my next book. And about, overcoming self-doubt because I think what you said in the beginning of this interview is if if people can take away one thing from this interview is what you said in the beginning where it doesn't matter if the world believes in you if you have billions of people that say you're the greatest you can do it if you don't believe that you're capable you'll never be able to live up to that potential or achieve those goals and the opposite if the world is saying you are crazy you can't do it this is a dumb idea you'll never be enough you suck it doesn't matter because if you firmly believe it only takes one, it only takes one either way. And most people don't understand that self-doubt is the killer of dreams. And if they can figure out how to eliminate the noise from the outside, but most importantly, eliminate the noise of the inside that keeps them from their dreams, then they can achieve them if they learn that process. And I was, a year and a half ago saying, okay, I'm gonna start working on my next book project. Then a few things came up in my life. You met me in a time, which I acknowledge you in a deep way because you met me in a time where I was going through um, some, some challenges with a breakup and also just people, whatever, gossiping about me, whether they knew what happened or not. And I was like, wow, I thought I knew my friends. And I, I started to quickly know my friends after these few months of, of challenge And I was really grateful for the wisdom you gave me. You said, you know, this is a blessing. It's a blessing for the ego to go through this type of thing because it allows you to have more compassion, more humility, everything you've been saying in this interview. and allows you to purge relationships in your life and purge ideas, thoughts, processes that maybe don't work for you anymore. I was planning to start writing this book a year and a half ago. And I started working on the proposal, but something wasn't clicking. 
And I was like, okay, well, this is an excuse and I'm not going to allow writer's block to hold me back. I'm going to keep going through this. So I kept doing it every single month working on the proposal, but still didn't feel, I didn't feel excited about it. I didn't feel proud of it or something was off. And then I felt guilty because I was like, huh, I'm not putting it out when I said I wanted to put it out. I'm not completing it when I said I wanted to do it. But there was a lot happening in my personal life as well. And I said, you know what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to come when it's ready, and I'm not going to put pressure on myself anymore. In this kind of year and a half plus season of not doing anything, quote unquote, has actually been a lot of insight, reflecting, research, and I just now in the last couple of weeks have dived back into the process because I feel like, wow, I've actually gathered so much data from the last year and a half of not working on it that I feel like I have the information I need now to move forward. So I think this time of reflection can always be powerful. I call it strategic messing around where you're like playing more, you're doing other activities and things are coming to you in a different way. You know, I, I think, Lewis, instinct is 100 times wiser than the intellect. Our intellect, right? Like most people, we're running our lives from our intellect. But the intellect is just the sum total of what society has told us is possible. Intellect. Th that's just what's been done before. That's what the experts tell us is possible. Well, look at Bannister in the four minute mile. No, a human being, if a human being runs a mile in under, a four, in under four minutes, They'll die. <laughs> she or she is going to blow yeah. up. But in the weeks and months afterwards, people started doing it. Mm -hmm. And then you just, you talk about you know, Elon Musk and what he's doing. You look at the great scientists. You look at Galileo who said, you know, the, the earth is round. And it just goes on and on. And I think... Any great creator, any hero, any history maker, any human being who wants to live life fully, completely, spiritually, creatively, we've got to learn how to trust the silent whispers of our instinct over the chattering voices of our intellect. And, you know, when you were talking about your book on overcoming self-doubt, criticism is a symptom of greatness. Mm. You know you are making traction around your creative ambitions when the cynics, critics, naysayers come out to play. That's when you know you're doing something great. I mean, I, I'm really big into documentaries and I watched a recent one on Miles Davis. And Miles Davis you know, great, you know, a legendary trumpet player, as you know so well. And he suffered, you know, a, a challenging childhood. He came from a, you know, a fairly well-off family, but he, he suffered from a lot of racism. And then he started playing trumpet and he became really good at it. And he played with his heroes, eventually did, uh, Duke Ellington and Charlie Parker, I believe. And then like a lot of people, they start playing like their heroes, but it wasn't until... He said, I've mastered the game, so now I can destroy the game. What did Picasso say? First master the rules so you can break the rules. Mm. And so Charlie Parker, technically, you know, world class at playing the trumpet according to the traditional rules. But his instinct said, this isn't where I want to go. Mm. I want to... I want to go blue ocean. I want to go green, green field. I want to do what no one else has done. And this is where my, my creativity, my instinct is leading me. And so he got into his late sixties. Bitches brew album. Where he experimented with cadences and styles and rhythms that no one had ever heard before. And in the documentary, his son said, you know, dad never kept his old albums at home. And the documentarian said, why not? And he said, because he wasn't interested in what he'd done before. Ooh. He was only interested. He was only interested in where he was going. He told John McLaughlin, the guitar player who played with him. He said, in this session, I want you to play as if you don't know how to play guitar. 
So all I'm saying is, you know, you're right. And we can talk about the tactics, but living your truest life as an artist, as a productive, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a, someone trying to make the world better, it begins with you doing the interior work. Mm-hmm. And that's why the 5M Club is so powerful. Yeah. Because you're giving yourself an hour while everyone else is asleep. The, the time of below is digital distraction. But the time of the least interruption. The time of the, it's the time of greatest quietude. And you're up at 4.15 or 4.30 or 5 a.m. And you have one hour to pray, to meditate, to visualize, to read the classics of the great women and men of the world who all will say and reinforce within our mindsets and heart sets. Trust your instinct. Learn to love yourself. Be too, do not be too much in the world and of the crowd mm. so that you learn to trust your values, your instincts, and take your craft and your life where you want to take it versus where society wants you to take it. And if you can start doing that through meditation, journaling, verbalization, visualization, reading, mentorship, et cetera, then you're, you're an army of one against the world. And I think that's how that great heroes roll. Mm. Um, I'm loving this. And do you think there are, from all the, the great leaders you've talked to of this moment right now, the, the billionaires, the, the CEO leaders, the, financially abundant leaders to high performers are those successful and wealthy people doing anything different than unsuccessful and wealthy people in this moment? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, let, let me just, if I may, I've worked with a lot of, super wealthy people. And one thing I want to emphasize is there are a lot of extremely wealthy people and money is all they have. Mm -hmm. And so I believe there are multiple forms of wealth. As a matter of fact, I do believe that once you pass a certain threshold of net worth and and annual income, you actually add complexity to your life, which destroys happiness and peace, and peace yep. of mind. You have to learn to be happy in spite of the wealth you create. The happiest cohort I have ever met in my life are ski instructors. I'm a level one ski instructor, which means I barely passed the grade, <laughs> but it was, it was a dream of mine. So I, you know, I went and I got it and I taught little kids to ski at minimum wage for a year and it was one of, you know, one of the great victories of my life. But the point I'm trying to make is they would always say, we're not rich. We're, uh, we don't have a lot of money, but we're really rich. Mm. They were just happy. Like they're out in the mountain. They were eating the food they wanted. They were turning people on to skiing and they were doing what they love to do. And so I just wanted to make that point, which is, you know, I've worked with a lot of billionaires, a lot of the celebrities that people would know about instantly. And that, you know, you probably know, I, as you know, I, I used to do the Titan Summit. I've had you know, a lot of the superstars on my stage. But generally speaking, you know, what's the expression? Mo, mo money? Mo problems. Mo problems. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I just, you know, Jim Carrey said it well. He said, be careful yeah. what you want because, yeah. So, um, but the people I work with right now, what they're doing is they are leaning out there. A lot of them are leaning out their businesses and looking for efficiencies. Mm. So it's a great time to rework your business if you're an entrepreneur and just ask yourself, what is your biggest, what is the single greatest opportunity right now for you to distribute astonishing value to your marketplace and then build all your resources around that Mm -hmm. singular, singular opportunity. I mean, great companies die not because they don't have enough good opportunities, but because they're chasing too many shiny toys. So that's what my clients are doing. Another thing they're doing is they are upgrading their health. They are biohacking. They're also upgrading their spirituality by meditation, by prayer, by journaling, by working with spiritual counselors. I mean, I think this is everyone saying, oh, it's a once in a generation pandemic. I think it's a once in a generation opportunity for us to look within and heal our hearts, Mm. develop ourselves and, and reconnect with who we're meant to be. 
Uh, the people I'm working with are also, a lot of them are, are reconnecting with their families, Lewis. I, I think a lot of industry titans are industry titans because they've lost the connection with their families. Mm. And so a, a lot of people I work with and mentor, it's like, you know, this forced quietude of the pandemic has allowed me to be a better father or mother and reconnect with my kids or my or my partner, or even, you know, I call it the great reset, even reconnecting with your priorities. You know, mm -hmm. you look at some of the trends like ruralization right now. People are leaving cities, moving out to yeah. the countries. People are working at home. So, I mean, this great upheaval will lead to much brighter days once we get through the mess. Mm -hmm. should, we, should we be focusing on the future or the present? You know, in order to be in flow state, we need to be in the present, obviously. In our morning routine, are we focusing on this moment, this day, or our dreams and aspirations of the future? How do we navigate that of future present thinking? What, what a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked it. What I would say is be like, be like uh, uh, you're climbing Mount Everest because you really are climbing your own private Mount Everest. Keep one eye on the summit and one eye on the climb. So your morning routine is the preparation for you to be a warrior poet during the day. Mm. But then when you're living your day, you know, if you're, if you're, let's say, writing your book or working on your code, or then you want to enter flow state. And we can talk about how to orchestrate your environment so you lit, enter flow state. And one of the ways is you, you, you leave your phone in another room because you can change the world or you pl play with your devices. You, you don't get to do both. So you, you live your day because your days are your life in miniature. You live your day fully in flow state and with fiery presence because that's all we have. You, you, you live your day because your presence on your work allows you to birth your genius on your work mm. or be with your family. But you also want to, be strategic because what's the point of climbing a mountain to realize you were in flow state climbing the wrong ones mm -hmm. and and to, to make it tactical mm -hmm. in in a time of crises i would say hope for hope for the best and plan for the best and prepare for the worst i would say spend i'm not i'm some i'm someone who's been saying you know sell your tv and don't watch the news for a quarter of a century <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now I'm starting to watch the news, but I think you want to do it very intentionally and very deliberately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see what's coming and then you can plan for it. And if you're an entrepreneur, you can battle proof your business for what's coming. And we can talk about the advice I'm giving to entrepreneur, my entrepreneurial clients, but you can, you want to be strategic. You want to plan for what's coming. You want to you protect your family for what's coming. And yet at the same time, you want to find ways to see the benefits that crisis brings mm -hmm. because suffering can breed great artistry. Calamity can breed great creativity. Nietzsche said chaos gives birth to dancing stars. I've done my greatest healing when I've been down on my knees. Right. That's when you're the most, you have to be the most present when you're suffering the most. It forces you to, be in the moment of that pain, right? Well, when the pain, exactly. When the pain is in your body. Yeah, it's all you think about. <laughs> you know, like I don't get how people go, oh, you know, I was heartbroken or I was going through a divorce. Or I was going through a, a bankruptcy or a job loss. So, so, you know, I, I just kept busy and I was out there having fun with my friends. Like I'm not judging and I understand we have different types, but for me, when I'm in pain, I'm like a, an animal. I need to go to the forest and lick my wounds. For, <laughs> you know, I, I need to lick my wounds. And mm -hmm. then once my wounds have healed, I go back into the world and I can, you know, mm -hmm. do the stuff that you do in the world. Yeah, and you may be healing for, you know, a year or two after something, a heartbreak, but you may be productive half the time and still need to heal a little bit here and there. So you don't have to always be in the woods for years when you heal. But uh, I understand that for sure. What are, what are, we talked about this in the, actually, I want to ask you, you mentioned the 
how to bulletproof businesses and the, some of the advice. Can you touch on that a little bit of what you're sharing with, with uh, you know, leaders on how to bulletproof their business and protect themselves during this time for making the most out of this opportunity? Well, I think for, the, I mean, this is the time that real leaders come out to play. I mean, anyone can be a leader in the sunshine, but when everything's falling apart, one of the books I've read in, in lockdown uh, is um, The Splendid and the Vile. And it's all about how Winston Churchill became Winston Churchill. And Lewis Winston Churchill became Winston Churchill May 10th, 1941, I believe, when he became the prime minister of the United Kingdom. And he was thrust into greatness. And so what I'm trying to suggest is hard times look bad to the ego, but it's in the, it's in the difficult times that we get to see what we're made of. I believe there is a, a, a mystical orchestration of life. Nature knows what she's doing. And so I think this is all happening for a reason. And I think when we experience the storms of our lives, I don't think they happen at, um, random times and so what i'm what i would say to, to leaders and entrepreneurs is number one there's always room at the top L look at peloton right now peloton is experiencing explosive growth exploding and and there are a lot of other you know look at online uh, uh online media companies look at the people in in our field who saw a lot of this, who, who have planned for things falling apart, so have built digital businesses and digital courses. And it just goes on and on. So what I'm saying is, you wanna as quickly as possible ask yourself, how long will this take, where will this go? I actually think this is gonna be a few years. I don't mean to be in, in any way negative, but I wanna be of service. You know, if you look at what's going on, I think there's the health crisis and the pandemic, and then there will be the, the hunger crisis, uh, which there is one now, but it, it's, there's going to be all the suffering from the fallout. And that's going to go on for a while. And so I would say, if you were to ask me for some entrepreneurial advice, it would be number one, ask yourself, what value can, can you give to the marketplace that your industry peers are not giving? Number two, I would, I would also say, right now, a lot of peers in the industry are getting knocked out of the game whatever the industry yeah. is, they're, they're scared, they're exhausted, they're contracting. So for someone who is feeling strong, again, the way you feel on the inside is going to determine the way you feel on the outside. That's why morning routine and the 5 a.m. club, that's why nutrition, that's why biohacking, that's why learning, that's why your daily habits are so incredibly important. If you don't have any confidence right now, you're not going to be able to build a yeah. build your business but ask yourself what value can i push to the marketplace that no one else is doing i would also ask um what where can i cut costs and lean out the business right now because in good times we fall in love with growth and when we fall in love with growth sometimes you know we we build a highly co complex business where all we need is a nimble little business that is actually more agile a um, few other things I would say is uh, clean out digital distraction right now. In the 5M Club, I talked about your Menlo Park. Um, Edison used to have a Menlo Park at the top of the hill in New Jersey, where he and his, co his teammates would go to get away from the world. And I think right now where we, we want to check the news, we want to you know, connect with our friends digitally, we want to do all those things. It's very easy to fall into the dopamine loop where we, where we become addicted to distraction and checking our notifications. And when that happens, you will not get into the flow state, which will allow you to do the work that will allow you to lead the field. You know, we're at war. We're at war, and it's not only against the coronavirus. We're at war against distraction. We're at war against digital wow. interruption. Right. It's a, war, it's a war because we must protect our genius. Because the world will be less of a place if we do not bring our light, our love, our genius to it. I believe that, man. Um, and, and in the first interview, we talked we talked a little bit about self doubt, and I wanted to bring in bring up and go a little deeper in that because we talked sure. about it here as well. I'm curious, 
Is there a difference between building self-confidence and eliminating self-doubt? I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about that. What I would, what I would say is I'm going to be very contrarian here. You know, so many people are talking about mindset mm -hmm. and you know this from our first interview, you know, it's like mindset is everything. It's like if you only build a PMA, positive mental attitude, the world will be okay. Well then if that was the case, I'm going to actually be a little bit dramatic and I would say that's the big lie of positive thinking. Mm. Now, does positive thinking not work? It does work. But a positive mindset without a purified heart set leads to an empty victory. Ooh. So what I would say on your question about self-doubt and what we try to do is we try to remove, we try to build confidence psych psychologically. We, meditate we visualize mm -hmm. and we read the books and we watch the podcast with our intellect yeah with our intellect but as human beings we are these four interior empires imp empires i teach in the 5m club it's not just mindset it is our psychology but it's also our emotionality our heart set and then it's our third interior empire our health set our mm -hmm. physiology and then it's the fourth interior empire that I wish more people were talking about because it's not weak, it's brave. Our fourth interior empire, our spirituality. So I would say when you use your morning routine or your nightly ritual or spend some time every day working on your four interior empires, that's when you release your ego. And when you release your ego, when there's no more darkness, all there is is light. Yeah. And and that, that means that's who we are. Our, our truest nature is pure creativity, vitality, love, heroism, compassion for other people, honor and honesty. So what I would say is the missing link in self-confidence and turning down self-doubt is read the positive books, listen to the positive thinking gurus, and get your psychology to world class because – your daily behavior does follow your deepest beliefs. No question. But then do something that not a lot of people on the planet are doing, which is do your heart set work, which is if you've got anger, sorrow, resentment, shame, guilt, repressed within your subconscious, within your heart set, well, then you're at war because you've got a positive mindset, but a toxic heart set. So doing that, emotional hearing is the game healing mm -hmm. is the game changer then you get into health set massage you release the toxicity from massage reiki acupuncture etc sweat lodges etc and then you do the soul set work where you connect to your higher power your inner hero you do those four things you start to dissolve self-doubt yeah can we can we achieve great things with pain and resentment and anger living inside of us? Well, it depends on what you define as great things. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of great companies have been created by very damaged people. Mm -hmm. And great music, so, great art. Well, <laughs> For sure. I mean, I was once on an airplane from New York, I believe New York to Paris sitting next to an artist. And he said, you know, I look for romantic partners who break my heart. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> Cause I it said, writes great songs. <laughs> he said, well, I go, why do you do that? He goes, because when I'm intimate with suffering, I do my greatest song, my oh greatest my art. So, but uh, what I would say is in many ways, a lot of the great companies have been created by damaged people and, and here's the point i'm trying to make they were never enough for mommy or daddy mm. so they were relentless and because they were relentless and never took no for an answer and just you know incredible drivers they built these great companies but is that a great company you see what i'm saying so if we want a, a great world i think a great world is built from a an intention of love. And this is not weak because I think the greatest yeah. artists, they were not coming from fear of not being a, the greatest artists, industry titans, 
world builders. I don't think they were building from a place of inferiority, insecurity, and not enoughness. Mm. I think the great masterpieces, mm. the great movements, were born of love. Mother Teresa worked from love. Mahatma Gandhi died with less than 10 possessions. Why? He didn't care about those things. He reached a level of spiritual maturity where that wasn't the game he played. He played a completely different game. It was, how can I bring love into the world? Mm. And I think our greatest teachers are teachers of love. And I think if you can be an entrepreneur, but operate from trying to serve the world and help the world and distribute awesome value to the world that lifts people's lives. If you're a painter who works from love because you want to bring joy to people through your craft, if you're a school teacher or a, a world leader who works from love and service and honor because you want to be a humble servant to humanity and you know that life is short ultimately, I think that's when you do amazing things. Yeah. That's beautiful. And why do you think people make excuses of their past, uh, of the, the present? Why do you think it's human nature to make excuses? Because it seems like what unsuccessful people do better than everyone else is they make a lot of great excuses. Whereas the successful people who are happier, healthier, achieving more in their genius are making less excuses. Why do we do this in general? Because we're human. You Why know, is it human uh, nature to make so many excuses? <laughs> because, because human nature is, we're flawed. Oh. I mean, I make, mis I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say right now, I make excuses too. I just make a lot less excuses than I did last year. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a journey. It's, it's, yeah. I think we all make excuses. And if you don't, you know, and the people who don't think they're making excuses are not aware of the excuses that everyone around them sees them making. Mm -hmm. So, um, but why do we do it? Because we are disconnected with who we truly are. You know, I think Joseph Campbell's hero story explains so much. And if you look at the matrix and the alchemist and uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, one of my mm -hmm. favorite books, and a lot of the great works in one way or another, they're talking about the hero st story. The hero is born in full blazing glory and in full intimacy with their genius. The hero goes out into the world and the world, remember Morpheus in that old movie, The Matrix, pulls the wool over their eyes. The hero then starts to be programmed, brainwashed, heartwashed. We get the messaging of our well-intentioned parents, but they give us their fears. Then we go to school. You can't be an astronaut. Be practical. And then we get the media and we get our peers. And so the whole of society works it's seduction and hypnosis on us. And then we wake up at 25, 35, 65, 105. Mere figments of who we're meant to be. Mm. And then we come up with this excuse. Yeah, but that's easy for Lewis Howes to do. That's easy for you to do, Robin. It's easy for Muhammad Ali or Kobe or Oprah or whoever it is. Because we have created a, perceptual filter, but not only perceptual filter, an emotional mm. mask. You know, one of your books, like, the, mm -hmm. the, the, I think it was what, the mask of authenticity, mask of ma masculinity. Mm -hmm. We don't only put masks over our psychology, we put it over our emotionality, our physicality, and our spirituality. And then we look through the masks so many times, we believe the stories, our lies are telling us are true. And we would take a bullet for our story because it is so incredibly scary to, to leave the foundations we believe are true. And that's why personal mastery is one of the, it's not weak. You know, people roll their eyes, oh, personal mastery, personal development, personal leadership. It's the most heroic thing you can do because look how brave it, it takes for you to look in the mirror and leave the foundations you've built your entire life on and go, go blue ocean. And that's why the mystics talk about the dark night of the soul. Because when you think it's all falling apart, that's when you're really waking up. Mm. Isn't it funny that every time there is a breakdown, uh, a break in the body, a break up in a relationship, uh, 
a near death experience in a family member or your life, that's when you, you open your eyes and say, Oh, this hurts. Uh, you know, something isn't working. Let me reevaluate what's not working and try to find the answer to what the truth is. Because the way I've been living has been a lie in some way, shape or form. It always seems to have, it always seems to take some major breakdown for us to wake up. Why? Why? Why can't we just say, you know what? Life is good, but it's not great. Why can't I, why can't we just wake up when it's good? Well, you know, I, uh, I feel like we're just hanging out, you know, and I, and I, and I love it because, <laughs> because I think, you know, these are, they're very meaningful questions to me. And I, in many ways, this is, this is my fuel. This is, this is the conversation that brings me alive. Um, Richard Bach once said, what, what the caterpillar thinks is the end of the world, the master knows is the butterfly. Mm. And I think this is re very relevant for what we're going through right now. Like my heart hurts for the people who have died as a result of the turmoil on the planet right now. And I, and I want to do anything I can do to be of service and helpful. Having said that, perspective is powerful as well. Our human society has gone through many upheavals. We've gone through plagues. We've gone through depressions. And I believe upheaval and volatility is necessary for the long-term survival of our mm. species. Mm -hmm. I walk in a forest not too far from my home, and there's a sign that says natural disturbances. And it said from time to time, Nature sends natural disturbances to this forest, like windstorms, fires, and insect, whatever the word is, I guess it's uh, invasions. Mm -hmm. When that happens, large tracts of this forest are knocked down. But this is necessary for the long-term survival of the forest. Mm. Well, nature is nature is nature, and we're all part of nature, and the planet is part of nature. And I believe what's happening on the planet now is absolutely necessary for the long-term survival of our species and the planet. There is a town in India that finally sees the Himalayas after 10 years because the smog is gone because of what's going on. Wow. So it looks really bad, and it is really bad, and we must acknowledge how we feel versus repress how we feel because that just breeds more toxicity. But let's also remember, you know, nature knows what it's doing and we are being taken to a better place. And so to answer your question head on, I think pain and suffering has got a bad rap in society. You know, I think the greatest spiritual lesson of all spiritual lessons is how may I find peace in the middle of a war zone? Ooh. You know, the greatest of all spiritual lessons is letting go. It's, yeah. to find com it's to find comfort amidst acute discomfort. So what I try to do is as things fall apart, go within, build a stronger inner core that is not so attached on what, to what's going on in the world. Because if you're not deriving your peace, joy, power, strength, creativity from, out, from outside of you, you're getting it from in, within you, which is where the masters play. Mm. The, only, the only reason something on the outside, whether it's a, a loss of a relationship or this or that, is because we are attached to what's on the outside, which is a, actually a very vulnerable place to be. So we shouldn't attach ourselves to outside things, but more inside things. If you want to be peaceful, and let's go deeper, you want to be free, you absolutely must find your axis of power from within then then, pe then people will say well robin are you saying i shouldn't build a billion dollar business are you saying i shouldn't write the next bestseller are you saying i shouldn't change the world are you saying i shouldn't have a beautiful home or whatever my heart's desires are no you have those desires because your heart wants those desires honor them but don't need them don't need them it's like when you see yeah. people who completely fall apart when they lose something on the outside I say this with deep respect, but it's, they were very attached to what was on the outside. I mean, you know, I, I read a lot of Marcus Aurelius in my mornings. 
and he just reminds me about the shortness of life. Like if mm -hmm. I get tomorrow, I'm a lucky man, Lewis. Yeah. I don't know. I, I could be knocked out of the game tomorrow. I could, I could get COVID tomorrow and I end up on a ventilator and I could die. So I try to keep my mortality very front and center for me. And I, it's not a platitude. It's not something I'm just saying here. I mean, it is when I say goodbye to my kids in the morning, I hug them and I kiss them because I don't know if I'll be around tomorrow. Mm. And if you build that kind of intimacy with your mortality, then you are in the world, but you're not of the world. And you don't really, you do your best, but it's all an illusion. And if you yeah. lose it, it doesn't matter because you're going to be, as, as Marcus Aurelius said, Alexander the Great and his mule driver ended up in the same place. They were yeah. just a bunch of dust. They were just a bunch of dust. Yeah, and I think, is it the country of Bhutan that focuses on their death five times a day and they're supposed to be some of the happiest people in the world because they have that perspective and gratitude and appreciation for life now? Yeah, but, I think Bhutan is the happiest country in the world and I think they met, they don't have a GDP, they have a you know gross happiness index. Yeah. Um, I was in South Africa and there was a gentleman who every time he would see a human being, he, his eyes would light up. And I said, you know, after spending a few days with him, I said, every time you see a human being, you know, you, you really come to life. Like you just really, you smile. And, and he said, uh, you know, Robin, I've seen a lot of dead people in my life. So every time I see a live person, it makes me very happy. And if we could, if we could only connect with the shortness of life and, you know, the beauty of every human being and the dignity of every human being and the value of every human being and the opportunity we're graced with if we are alive today to do some, some beautiful work that contributes and to share some love and some joy. And, and it doesn't mean you have to work all the time. I mean, yeah. I, I you know, take a good nap too. That's another part of enjoying life, right? Of course, yeah. This has been amazing. I want to I ask you a couple of final questions to wrap things up uh, before I get to them. I want to make sure people check out your book, 5 a.m. Club. This is going to, if you've enjoyed this so far, you're going to love this book. And I believe you have it on audio as well, uh, Audible. Yeah, it's on Audible. Uh, people are loving the audio book and you can get it on Amazon.com and all the usual places. Yeah, you should get the book, get up at 5 a.m. Or, or start at 6 or 7 if you need to get started there, and then work towards 5 and read this for 20 minutes a day or listen to it for 20 minutes a day while you're working on your routine. Uh, but this is really going to support you in your life. Even if you just took one idea away from this book, it will add value to your life and help you. And you also have some free resources for people uh, at robinsharma.com slash greatness. Can you share what these resources are to help people sure um so i wanted to to contribute some strong value to all your followers lewis in this time where a lot of people are facing you know a lot of volatility and uncertainty and, and a lot of stress and challenge so i put together what i call the victory over difficulty toolkit and these are three uh, strong high value reports. The first is the Victory Over Difficulty Manual. It's not long, it's about a 15 page um, handcrafted report that will help creative people, productives, and entrepreneurs navigate these times so they battle proof their lives and their businesses uh, and then come out of this much stronger than before. The second resource is. Um, the, the war measures manual. And I believe we are at a war against the coronavirus and distraction and economic challenges. And so I think it's really smart to look at how the greatest warriors navigated difficulty. And that's what that report is about. And then the final thing is actually a full ebook. I believe it's about 80 pages long and it's called the world changers manifesto. Obviously, no charge whatsoever, pure value. And you're right, it's at robinsharma.com slash greatness in celebration of the School of Greatness. I love that. I love that. I want to ask you uh, a couple final questions. Uh, and, and you had some amazing answers the last time on your three truths and your definition of greatness. And I may, I may tease people and not share what you said, but 
really powerful responses. And I want people, and I'll link it up in the show notes to go listen to the previous interview where you can hear those answers. So I have a different question for you today beyond the three truths in your definition of greatness. Uh, is happiness the goal today for people or is it an outcome of following a routine in your day-to-day -day life? Is it the goal or is it the outcome? I think it's a byproduct. I believe the goal is truth. Now, truth is not some kind of philosophical truth. I'd say the goal is truth. Live your truth. That could be do work that's meaningful for you. Your truth. Live your values, even if no one believes in you. Your truth. Stand in your power versus external power. But I think the goal is to be truthful to yourself. I think if you do that, you're going to be happy because then you're not becoming who the world wants you to be. You're authentic and honorable to yourself. And that's when you fall in love with yourself. When you fall in love with yourself, you do amazing work because you wouldn't betray and dishonor yourself. You eat great food. You get up early, you exercise, you treat people well. I think if people understood the art of falling in love with yourself, the world would be much better because it took me 30 years to learn how to forgive, heal, let go of anger, resentment. And it was, I was constantly in war in my emotions and I was still productive and it, it drove me to achieve, but it didn't make me feel peace inside. And it wasn't until I started to heal all those past things and say, okay, I'm allowed to love myself. That's when I started to truly feel fulfilled. That's when I could sleep at night without stressing. I mean, that's when I truly started to unlock um, who I am. And I think it's a, a game we should all learn how to play well uh, is how to love yourself. And it's probably a lifelong journey. I'm, you know, I'm not sure what it's going to look like in 10, 20, 30 years from now. Hopefully I can continue to live that long, but I'm sure it's a constant process, right? It's a, it's a messy, dangerous, amazing, wonderful, incredible process. I think it's the best sport you could ever play. I think the world is selling us a, good, a bill of goods, which is the goal in life is FFA, fame, fortune, and applause. I've never felt happy from fame, fortune, and applause. For a day, I do. Right. But I believe the real goal in a completely different sport is JPF, joy, peace, and freedom. And the interesting thing in joy, peace, and free, joy, peace, and freedom doesn't come from anything in the world. It comes from learning who you are, living your truth, expressing your truth, loving yourself. Here's the paradox. If you have that level of power where you're deriving your creativity, your love, your honor, your expression from everything within, the world beats a path to your door because mm. you're, so incredible, you're so incredibly powerful. That's true. Things unfold. Things naturally come to you. You're like a magnet of all your dreams. We could, I'm, I'm, we could write a whole book on this whole episode. Robin, I really acknowledge you for your consistency of how you show up in the world for being there for human beings. I mean, again, the way you were there for me, when you came on the interview the first time a year and a half ago, you met me at a time when I was going through some challenges and you really showed your light towards me and you were there for me in a powerful way. And the way you keep showing up for yourself, keep writing to serve humanity. It's, it's inspiring, my friend. And I want everyone to get this book, 5 a.m. Club. It's going to change the game for you. I promise you. Go check it out right now. Robin, is there any final thoughts? Because I want people to go listen to your three truths and definition of greatness on the episode, on the other episode. But is there any final thoughts while we wrap this I, up? I just say, you know, when I've gone, I remember a particularly hard time in my life and someone said something and he just said, this too shall pass. And obviously it's, it's a, it's a, old piece of wisdom, but that really helped me. And I want to say to everyone tuning in here, you know, what we're going through will pass. Better days are ahead. And um, the key is to ask yourself, when I'm looking back at this time that we've navigate that we have to navigate right now in five years, what will I wish I would have done during the time of the pandemic to set me up for a glorious life as I go ahead? And I'd, I'd secondly, I'd, I'd say, you know, you are stronger than you know, everyone. And how many times have we faced a crisis? We didn't think we could get through it. We get through it. And the final thing I'd say is I'd like to applaud you 
Lewis, you know, you, um, you're very consistent. You really care about the world and all the, pe all the work you do. And I think, you know, um, I just want to celebrate you for, uh, you know, you're changing the world. And, uh, and, and you have, I think you have a really good heart. And I want to, you know, I want to just celebrate you for that. And, and um, you know, thanks for reaching out to me. I also have an afternoon snack, but then in the evening, my meals tend to be relatively low in meat and protein because, and higher in starches, which activate the tryptophan system and the serotonin mm -hmm. system, which makes it easier to fall asleep. You can repack glycogen during the night so you can do muscular work the next day. Wow. Training of any kind, but also thinking. Your brain uses glucose. Sure, sure. So at night,